Hello, and welcome to our daily social environment. Um, I'm JC, I'm gonna be emceeing today, and we're very excited to have Lauren Bond, um, an artist from Los Angeles with us for the 50th ever Earth Day, um, kind of commemorating the, the uh, large scale act of resistance in response to the 1969 oil spill in Santa Barbara, um, which is very close to where Lauren's studio practice is based. Um, I'm going to start with a few housekeeping um, notes and then I'll turn it over to Fong Bui and Lauren Bond. We're going to be recording this for the Rail Archives, as always, um, and so if you prefer not to be seen, you can turn your video off in the bottom left corner. Um, we'll be fielding questions from the audience at the end in the last 15 or so minutes. Um, so if you do have a question for Lauren, you can just leave that in the chat box. Um, and I will call on you and unmute you so you can ask the question. Um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box, say what's up, uh, ask questions, make comments, just, you know, be social. Um, thanks all for joining us. And Fong, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, JC. Thank you for the quick intro. I must say that in thinking about coming today now and having this opportunity to talk to Lauren, it just reminded me so rare in life that occasionally you meet someone who you immediately identify as your comrade, soulmate, comrade in arms, they, as they say, where you fight in the front and so that someone is always there with you. So I feel very um, incredibly inspired. I know that, Lauren, we met through our beloved friend, the legendary Jonas Makers, a shout out for Jonas um, in the late, I think, April in 2016, even though I was somewhere else, so I didn't manage to see the screen in it, your, your film, the 100 moons walk in the Los Angeles aqueduct at Anthology Film Archives. Uh, but I did manage to see it as, thing, as soon as you sent me the addition uh, of the slogan, artists need to create on the same scale society had the capacity to destroy cast in clay. I was so happy and I looked up and see the actual neon, you know, and I immediately felt, especially when Trump withdrawn from the Paris Agreement, agreement on climate uh, change mitigation in June um, 2017. I, I was reminded immediately that when we did the Sandy show after the destruction of Superstorm Sandy in 2013, the show was called Come Together, Surviving Sandy, Year One, which we collaborated with Nautilus Foundation and Industry City. That show was healed, it's 100,000 square feet. We did it in two months. It was amazing coming together from all artists and the seven art, you know, we have so much public programming. We're so excited, music, poetry, reading, film screening, whatnot. And I remember when that happened between receiving the artist need to create slogan, I immediately talked to my team and we wanted to do the big show at Occupy Mana. It was our way to respond to Trump's divisive agenda, political agenda. And that show was the first time that we really feature your neon along with a few other works too. But the neon became, I would say, the official slogan for the real cultural project because it spoke so much presciently for our time. How artists now being seen as so-called stepping up to the plate to do the thing that they could do now where they couldn't prior. In other words, I thought of Love Sculpture by Robert Indiana that spoke for the 60s, but the neon work is just so amazing. To me, it will be forever the slogan of any the Real Kill Tour project undertaking from now on onward. So I want to start out with that, to, to just simply ask, how did that come about and why did you make it into a neon? Because I know that we talk about variety of sizes. It can be you know, remade in different sizes and mm -hmm. scale. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to speak with you today on Earth Day. And thank you for calling in to this conversation, Jonas Nikas. And at this point, I'd like to call in some other ancestors, uh, Sherry Rabinowitz and Kit Galloway, who originally had made the statement that artists need to create 
on the same scale that society has the capacity to destroy. For their electronic cafe in the 80s, that was a strategy to combat nuclear arms race by setting up an electronic cafe, not too different from what you and the Brooklyn Rail have set up with our new social environment. Their idea is that Cold War dynamics could be um, mitigated by being able to have a cup of coffee with someone who is your supposed enemy. So they had originally said, uh, said that statement and my um, um, appropriation of that statement as the mission statement for Metabolic Studio really came with an understanding also of the nuclear arms race as being the uh, big challenge on the level of scale mm -hmm. for artists working at least in the Intermountain West. The uh, Intermountain West uh, is a region that uh, the studio defines as our watershed. Uh, we, we, unlike uh, the East Coast, which is challenged by sometimes too much water, have a disappearing watershed. We're actually in a mega drought. Mm -hmm. um, and all of the major rivers that fall from the Rockies and move their way west through the Great Basin have a major challenge because the Great Basin was the location of the nuclear arms testing in, in uh, mid-century modern thinking. That was the least worst place to bomb uh, because it looked like there was nothing there. So in thinking about what a uh, post 9-11 art practice could look like mm -hmm. where the commodification of art needed to be replaced with a mandate to re-envision the world along a regenerative principle. Um, thinking about how could we as a studio work to, work to the scale of the nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. So Sherry and Kit's mandate that we needed to define our scale individually to what our brain could um, comprehend mm -hmm. and attach all of our work product to it was how that neon got generated. Super cool, because scale is no proportion. You're absolutely right. It's psychological, for sure. Um, but you have an unusual training in a way. I want to talk just a bit about that. Hopefully, you can provide some of the responses, Lauren. You, 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 you start out tr being trained as a dancer. You work with Martha Graham. And then you went to Princeton, where you study art, and then went to MIT for a grad for graduate school in architecture. And yeah. how, how did those experience inform and at least led you to become an artist? I mean, yeah. with the light, but nevertheless, never too late. So um, movement has always been my most um, facile way of learning. So I, I an immersive learner, and sometimes when uh, I dance or I move or I um, experience my body in space, I become the most receptive mm -hmm. to a, a way of being in the world. Um, so as a child and as an adolescent, dance was my um, practice through which I um, learned about my environment. Um, when I realized as a college student um, that I didn't uh, perhaps assimilate knowledge as well through books as I did through movement, I was able to get an apprenticeship with Martha Graham. And it was through that apprenticeship that I found myself in the back of house space, uh, working for the amazing sculptor Isamu Noguchi mm -hmm. on his masks for Martha Graham stage design. Oh yeah. And it was uh, my fascination in working with him that led me from dance into thinking about the story that is created through performance, mm -hmm. through costumes and lighting and how absolutely critical it was for Martha to yeah. retell the classics. Mm -hmm. So um, it was uh, in that uh, 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 rubric that I realized that studying architectural history and theory yeah. was critical because I wasn't primarily interested in the theater as a stage. I was interested in the world as a stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that learning about the building blocks of how to make things stand up, how you permit uh, the ideas that you want to stand up in the public sphere um, is what I looked at. And I specifically focused 
on the architectural history and theory of how total abstraction occurred following the Great War and modern memory. Mm -hmm. So that was my trajectory um, into the art world is um, understanding through movement yeah. and through social trauma yeah. what the practice of making things could be. Well, that makes sense because the last, I think the last time that we spoke uh, at length before our collaboration in Venice at the Collateral Project, when I visited you in Metabolic Studio in, in LA a year prior, I remember we spoke about our deep interest in Steiner. And of course, dance and music was a huge part of, of his teaching. And I remember how we spoke, how deeply he himself was influenced by Goethe you know, where thinking is an organ of perception, no more, no less than, let's say, um, the, the, the ear hear the sound or the eye see things. So thinking itself, perceiving the same with ideas, mm -hmm. you know? And I remember we talk about um, among all his activities, but I would like to sort of stress on your interest some point in, you know, uh, biodynamic architecture, because that's something that, 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 that he advocated strongly for ecological and sustainable approach to architecture that increased soil fertility without the use of chemical fertilizer and petrocyte. And I know we spoke about that at length. So would you say that you discovered Steiner in college or already when you were at Graham or working with Naguchi? Um, I've, I think that Steiner is one of these um, um, proto-pollinators of my life. I mean, it's hard to say when I discovered Steiner because it's like, it's like he's a dandelion that just, his memory, his ethos is like a dandelion that sort of wafts through time and space and at different times his genius, his profound genius grabs one or other idea of mine. Um, you know, I often um, think that when I really came to understand uh, Steiner's existence was in that pivot point where I started to think about the movement between abstraction and total abstraction in art after the um, turn of the century and after the Great War. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Steiner really had the courage to sort of introduce a very unsarcastic Mm -hmm. view of life which was coming from a very pure place mm -hmm. where he was really suggesting that um, anthroposophy would be some kind of union between man and knowledge mm -hmm. and that if we allowed our senses to inform us and not just our minds if we could immerse ourselves mm -hmm. in the building blocks of life on life's terms then we would have a non-hierarchical knowledge base yeah. by which everybody could participate in moving the world forward. Mm -hmm. So I think it was this um, moment in time that he really was working um, at his high point, which was the early part of the 20th century until yeah. he died in the 20s, yeah. where he was part of this movement to re-envision a world along completely novel lines. And of course, a big part of that was to um, think about how our relationship with the ground, how our relationship with the earth yeah. could, be our, could be our teacher yeah. and could make us well. Um, yep. and, and, and through that, how everybody could be an artist because everybody who can touch the earth can be teachable in profound ways mm -hmm. by all of the things that make the ground possible for us to live through and by. You're absolutely right about his conviction to the notion of political equality and human rights, part of his social reform. And you write about the non-irony part because that was how Joseph Boyce responded to him so committedly. And when Joseph Boyce made the famous work quite early, I think it may have been in 1967, 66, uh, the silence of Masha Dusham is overrated because he really went against Dusham 
um, you know, fascination with Poincaré, you know, Henri Poincaré, limits to knowledge. So he supplemented as the opposite, uh, you know, the idea of no limits to knowledge. And that's mm -hmm. exactly why the warm material was being used against the cold intellectual approach to Duchamp in a way. But let's go back a little bit here. J JC, can, can we just begin to show some images? I want to share with our readers and viewers the neon. So this is a neon, the one that I think we did it at Occupy Mana in September. Um, 2018. As opposed to the next piece, now it takes the form of <laughs> of uh, a, a logo or an emblem standing up like a sculpture outdoor. But this is the view from the the courtyard of our collateral project in the last Venice Biennale. And what you see below is Maya Lin reflecting on the light coming up from Lawrence Neon there. And uh, we talk about scale. So I can imagine one day that it could be seen easily on billboard size on, I don't know, maybe the BQV in Brooklyn or the, you know, the High Line and whatnot. And so talking about Steiner, can we begin to see the other works that was included in the show here? Like for example, your fascination with bees? Mm -hmm. So uh, the honey chandeliers um, were, were made um, from a collection of honey that I gleaned from uh, an early communication project that I still continue with beekeepers from war-torn countries around the world. Um, I'm interested in conversations with them about how different forms of military conflict and aggression against the landscape was affecting beekeeping. And um, through those dialogues, these beekeepers would send me back jars of honey, usually in milk containers, yeah. uh, that I would um, use to hang uh, at, with light um, as a chandelier. Um, so this, this is um, an allusion to both the uh, Steiner idea of uh, the bee as an um, example of a social sculptural um, system, the way, the way bees work, uh, um, also his um, uh, reminder that, yeah. um, that bees are required for culture because without their ability to support agriculture, we need to go back to being hunters and gatherers. Yeah. So an act of uh, culture is to support bees. And if something is not a support of bees, then it's an anti-cultural posture by, by definition. Yeah. Um, and then of course, Joseph Boyce's uh, uh, project for Documenta years ago was Honey Pump, where he took um, um, thousands of gallons of honey and circulated it around a gallery which also talked about how we're all connected yeah. um, in the circulatory system around um, the nectar of life um, with all of its poetics. But I would like to um, draw the uh, study that I've done through the years um, that almost every um, religion has yeah. stories about the disappearance of bees and the emergence of bees yeah. and connects it to our human consciousness so that it's been said that often that famine, which is caused by the disappearance of bees, is the only thing capable of stopping war. Mm -hmm. So um, the disappearance of bees might also be the bees' higher intelligence helping us to save ourselves from conflict that we're incapable of solving without famine. Yeah. I mean, I mean, of course, among the, 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 going back to our interest in Steiner again, I mean, he was so prolific. Among the 2000 lectures, public lecture that he gave um, the last years of his life, of course, nine was devoted to um, the subject of bees. Yeah. And I think bees was an aspiration for him as, as an ideal community. 
beehive is definitely permeated by the notion of love, equal distribution of labor also. Among all the healing attrib attribute, Lawrence, which is, I think it's very important because the, the attribute to, to, to healing, as a healing device or agent, it's something that I also identify in this work. Can we see the next one? JC, because I think they may be the, the yeah. yeah. This is where the, the, some of the honey came from. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, this, this, this is uh, where a lot of the honey um, that I have shown comes from. I think some is in your collection, but this was a work that is separate from the chandeliers and that this was a jeweler's cabinet, a discarded jeweler's cabinet, where um, I ins uh, inserted with the help of a beekeeper two active hives side by side, uh, which was mimetic of human lungs mm -hmm. um so there's a sort of two chambers of the lungs and it's also it was a bit of a study on um the competitive nature of beehives because uh, it's very rare for two queen bees to set up in an adjacent space yeah. they're very territorial so this was uh shown at ace gallery uh, in mid wilshire for nine months which was a very long exhibition and uh, it was shown in a small room that had two holes cut into it <clears throat> so that the bees could leave and go pollinate and um, collect nectar during the day and then come back and build these hives. Yeah. And the sound was broadcast throughout the, uh, throughout the um, nine month exhibition. And there's, so there's a soundtrack that goes with this sculpture that you showed at Mana and it's now called a music box. So that sculpture um, is, uh, comes with a nine month soundtrack. And in fact, one hive did um, take over the other. Yeah. Um, and there would, uh, it was qu quite an interesting thing to watch that negotiation. And there's a component of sound which we weren't able to accommodate here, Lawrence. Yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's the part that I like to also mention a little bit about the I think the ability somehow um, that some of us who believe in the notion of art is a form of activism or art as part of life and life inject into the activism of art um, make me remind of this wonderful Japanese proverb which where every morning when I wake up I repeat it I say to myself it goes, vision without action is a daydream. Action without vision is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that I treasure very much. And I think this is something you, among all the few friends, people I know, seem to understand very well. I would include Aggie Gunn, obviously, um, for part of her work at, uh, Studio in the school, and of course, you know, Art for Justice Fund. She created, among other things that she has been doing. Jean LeMay of Mana Contemporary. Uh, I would count Jean among those people. And of course, you know, our friend Brian Dorries, who just came in on, spoke last Thursday about theater of war. And there's other people. In other words, you know, it's a very, a um, very challenging task. Cameron Gaynor, the publisher of the Third Rail, should be in that mix too. Artists who undertake all the social, political challenges. And for you who have gone through the project, for example, not a cornfield, not a cornfield, that was 2005, I believe, was in a good example of that, Lauren. I mean, yeah, so what, what we're, we're, we're talking about here is if you take the, the cognitive frame of the jeweler's box and you expand it to not a cornfield, what you'll see is that uh, we're still working to create the, the context for bees and other pollinators to create effect and to have agency. So bee box puts in a very contracted space a relational piece between two working teams, but mm -hmm. to take it into a field, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
to take that idea that um, to have agency means to take that that frame and to support the pollinators on a on a much bigger territory. So, um, and again, in the work with the Metabolic Studio, we're talking about a territory of the Intermountain West, so a watershed territory. And what is the role of uh, of artists if our primary role is to support pollinators? Right. So this, but, but you have it, to, uh, you know, you have to go so much bureaucratic requirement, Lauren, in order to materialize this yeah. project. So can you share with us a little bit of that? How long did it take you from the very beginning to the completion of the project? Not a cornfield was a complete miracle from, from the day that the it, vision for not a cornfield came to me to the day the start the project ended was one year. So that was an absolutely miraculous uh, situation. Um, uh, and it, and, and the, the lawyers that went with me to the, the uh, California State Parks uh, said, don't get used to that, that will never happen again. Um, the uh, journey to take this same field, this 32 acre uh, breadbasket of the Gabrielino Indians where something like corn used to grow and reconnect it to the LA River has taken eight years and we're finally under construction and has required uh, 76 federal, state, and local permits to do something which is truly obvious, mm -hmm. which is to redirect a small portion of a wastewater river that's flowing out to sea and bring it to a 32 acre, what used to be brownfield place incapable of supporting life yeah. and allow it to um, do its work so that the industrial corridor of downtown Los Angeles can be fertile again. So some, some, the beginning, the genesis of this project was completely off the charts fast, mm -hmm. but the culmination of this project uh, since not a cornfield in 2005 to when we expect uh, the Bending the River project to be complete will be like a 20 year project. Yeah. So uh, we uh, started in construction last September, finally. I see, and, and I mean, for bees and honey, we can all understand it's a universal um, identification or a form or substance that we know that it's associate universally. But why uh, corn? Why corn and not something else? In well, well, because this, this project, um, came to me in a dream yeah. as corn and it was only later that I understood its epistemological connection to the Lakota Indians mm -hmm. and so this vision was sent to me by Grandpa Roy Stone of the Lakota tribe as a act of consciousness for sending back the buffalo mm -hmm. that were overgrazing on Catalina Island in 2004. Yeah. So that's a whole complete uh, other trajectory that connects to um, this, the social service that I feel my practice is an homage to, and that is to the native people of the North Americas, whose wisdom and knowledge about how to live on the land is essential for us to embrace. So I brought a piece yeah. of corn. This is a piece of corn from uh, not a cornfield. And, and just to say that each, each seed here yeah. is capable of growing a plant with two cobs like this. Yeah. And so survival itself connects to things like growing a, a piece of this that once dried can last forever. So mm -hmm. that was the origin of the concept for me of a studio that would be focused on the metabolic that yeah. native corn in the arid west was the most profound monument that even though scale might be 32 acres it's the seed that's monumental not not the acreage i see and and lauren would it possible to say that somehow your interest in salmonism from the native friends for example, you just mentioned Grandpa Roy. 
uh, it's, it's also a form of healing, just like the way we can associate with voice, activism. and social. Absolutely. I mean, um, shamanism has had an interest in me. <laughs> <laughs> like I have did not get trained to think yeah. about shamanism, but there are such profound healers out there. Mm -hmm. They find us mm -hmm. and work through us, artists, poets, scientists, thinkers, um, and remind us that if we're teachable, mm -hmm. um, we can be agents that can manifest rebalance and regenerative practice. Yeah. When, when I began Not a Cornfield, I had no idea even how to plant a corn seed. Yeah. So it was after we had laid 90 miles of irrigation stripping and brought in hundreds of truckloads of soil from other places that I was sitting in my trailer and I had a knock on the door yeah. from a Native American man who had heard at a local thrift store about a lady who was going to plant corn in the historic core and offered his services to me. And we held an all night ceremony on the cornfield when it used to be an old derelict train yard. Mm -hmm. And we did ceremony before we planted the first seed. So it was by being an agent for the manifestation of shamanism that this project happened. I cannot claim authorship of this concept. It came through me, but it yeah. was as a result of that perceptual frame changing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that I feel I felt um, uh, empowered to work to a scale that I felt I had the capacity to change and that is this infrastructure monument of bending the river back into the city yeah. it seems like if I could reconnect the river with the historic floodplain that there would be something meaningful that would come of that that would not be in the shape of my creation but yeah. would be a manifestation of putting right balance back to where it already was to re to re um, enchant a floodplain which had been buried for more than 150 years. Yeah, I mean, I just talk. I just talked to William Adam two weeks ago on Monday about how we can be more readily undertake complexity or issue of complexity all at once. In other words, it has to be multi-platform that we able to materialize all kind of things that lie between art and life, nature, you know, natural environment and man-made, you know, environment and whatnot. And this, of course, I would assume that was similarly um, done for 100 moves walking the LA um, walk or this, well, yes, this, uh, this, this question of, of water yeah. um, in the arid west, um, when you look at the floodplain of the LA River and you connect uh, and you connect the water that I put on not a cornfield um, to its source, it was the snow cap of the eastern Sierra that actually was irrigating the cornfield, not the LA River. Yeah. So that uh, reality that the city of Los Angeles, in order to grow and support the film industry um, in the early part of the 20th century, which was really transforming the city, our very young city here, from an outpost into a, a major city, um, owes a debt of gratitude to the silver mining of, of the West, uh, which was at in these same mountains, uh, which uh, 60, 70 years after silver mining ended, we would exploit uh, knowledge of the snow cap to create a gravity fed system that would bring the snow to Los Angeles uh, yeah. uh, in the form of an aqueduct, like mm -hmm. people have done for thousands of years. I mean, the stories of all great cities getting made uh, yeah. has been about moving water where you want it to go. Yeah. So I felt that, um, that dr for the centenary of the opening of the LA Aqueduct, an artist action wanted to occur where we draw the line yeah. in space, again, going back to my dance training, to put my body in space, uh -huh. um, to actually 
internalize, physicalize the 240 mile um, network of channels, pipes, and siphons that bring the snow cap of the Eastern Sierra yeah. to uh, downtown Los Angeles with the labor force that built the aqueduct to begin with, which was the mule. Yeah. So, and the mules still exist in the Owens Valley. Um, they were brought there by miners as a way to carry water from the foothills of those mountains up to the mining encampments. Yeah. So they, they were, um, they've been in the West since silver mining and they're a, a mainstay of the tourist industry, uh, taking people up into the Great Sierra yeah. uh, for trips. But they've also been, the mule packers and the mules have also been a part of the studio's performative action of building soil for the people of the Owens Valley. Yeah. Um, one of the things that has uh, been a byproduct of removing the water from one place so that another could thrive is the agricultural richness of the Owens Valley has been sacrificed um, and Metabolic Studio has been active in creating a network of growers that can use the mule carbons uh, to build soil and distribute it to a network of growers throughout the Owens Valley um, or what the Paiute call Paya Hunadu, a place where there will always be water. So yeah. this is a unification drawing between yeah. one place and another that relies on uh, each other for survival, very yeah. much like the bee box was a two-chambered box. Ah. Uh, so there's, again, this idea of exploding scale and creating a relational connection uh -huh. between um, two places that are, in fact, one place. It's beautiful, because, but also at the same time, it horrified me. I remember reading um, Baudelaire, there's several beautiful books on him, one being Init Starkey, and of course, Gautier, also a very famous one on Baudelaire, who's definitely my favorite art critic and poet. And I was horrified to find out, hearing you describing, to bring the two together, how the politic of race is based so much on the, the insular attitude towards purity of one race, one nation, rather than allowing, encouraging the, the idea of hybridization um, to naturally occur. If two people from two different races um, fall in love, get married, it's so on, interracial marriages. In other words, when I first discover that the word mulatto um, was directly applied to Baudelaire's, you know, lover, uh, Jean Yuval, who was considered a mulatto, even though we know that she's been immortalized in so many of his poems, uh, exotic perf performed the dancing serpent, one of my favorite, the balcony. She's been painted with, by Manet, but she was a product of, you know, the father who was Frank Kokosian, the mother's from Haiti, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's it, exactly what Mu means because it came from the male, um, I believe it's, a, it, it, it's the male donkey and the female horses. In the, yeah, exact the product. So I was yeah. horrified to discover that. Um, so it, it, it have a, amazing metamorphosis. Uh, thank you. Thank you for bringing up that. I mean, I think a lot of times we think of the mule as uh, nature, and yeah. the mule was actually one of the first hybrid animals designed to do our labor. So, you know, it's a, uh, uh, we owe an amazing debt of uh, cultural gratitude to the mule, um, the labor force that um, has built the West, uh, built the aqueduct, uh, built the Erie Canal, built the Panama Canal, made George Washington's fortune when he imported the mule from Europe. Um, it's because they have um, profound intelligence and very unique feet um, yeah. that allow them to be trailblazers. They're still used to fight the megafires of the West. Yeah. And this is a, a composite pre-Zoom Zoom style photo <laughs> of all of the Wranglers and uh, the Metabolic Studio team that uh, took 
the walk uh, from one full moon to the next in 2013, four weeks uh, to survey the aqueduct and celebrate the mule through every um, town and landscape uh, and place that that water traveled. And we learned, I learned so much from these people and they in turn credit so much of what they learn from their own hybridization of their daily work life with these incredible um, intelligent sentient beings, yeah. the mule. And can we go to the next JC because I think going back to cornfield we talk about maybe the next one uh, because you know the, 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 the these was invented in yeah. the course of everything else the you know the luminal camera here yeah Can you share us a little bit of the origin and what what yeah. drove you to create this well this is another allusion to a major uh infrastructural artery of the alameda corridor. Metabolic Studios sits not only adjacent to the LA River, but next to a network of train lines and tunnels that connects the port of Long Beach with stores across the United States through the shipping container, which is the standard unit of international trade. So yeah. the liminal camera was a subversion of the shipping container from a container which would contain goods and services to a container which would contain nothing but image and light. Um, yeah. So uh, the Metabolic Studios Optics Division, which is, uh, consists of me, uh, Richard Nielsen, and Tristan Duke, uh, we built this camera, retrofitted a shipping container, um, put it on a truck, and took several tours across the United States to document failing infrastructure. Um, mm -hmm and developed uh, that film using the um, often toxic waterways that were the subject ourselves, And we, we can use that camera as a dark room as well as a social practice teaching room. And we can show the work uh, magneted to the outside of the container. So wherever we would go, we would immediately develop and show the print so that people who were on location would see the results right away. Yeah, we don't have any images here, before we get here, we don't have any images to explain how the process of the photograph got developed, Lauren, but can you just share it briefly how yes. that came about? Absolutely, and I'm sure the studio team will post something on the chat bar. Um, so this is a picture of the Owens Dry Lake, which is um, a hundred mile lake that was dried up by the removal of water from the Owens Valley or Paya Hunadu in order to bring water to Los Angeles. Um, and it is held in trust for the people of the state of California as a water body, which means you can recreate there to your heart's content. So as a performative action, the optics division uses the dry lake bed to um, develop our film in. We've mm -hmm. discovered the extremophilic bacteria that's latent in those ponds actually can replace photographic fixative. Yeah. So we take our photographic negative that we develop inside the liminal camera and under cover of darkness, we go out onto that lake and we dig a hole and we bury those large format prints in the dry lake bed and then we come back in the morning and take them out and rinse them in the river. So in that way, we recreate, we're, we, we're allowed to go there as, as are all of you. Um, we bring consciousness to the scar of the city of Los Angeles. We own it, say this is a place that's important to be at and, and, um, and use. Mm -hmm. um, but we also rethink the agency Mm -hmm. of even a dry lake bed. So what is it, the fact that a dry lake bed has photographic agency is an extraordinary thing. Yeah. Um, so um, the, a lot of the images that we have are uh, effectively scarred by their night in the lake brine, yes. um, but they also um, bring to the surface the metal uh, that's latent in a photograph um, 
uh, not a digital photograph, but an actual photograph, which is actually made out of silver, suspended, yeah. um, suspended onto a surface like paper or glass. Um, so we're interested in, in doing that. We also, when, when we develop like this image of the dry lake bed was developed inside the camera and not fixed in the lake, yeah. we, take, we take the water uh, that is the photographic effluence and we um, spin it out and um, re retrieve the silver in the wastewater and yeah. make our own photographic materials from the silver that we um, glean out of the photographic developing. And how big is this piece? The, the size uh, of that's, a, that's a standard roll width, which I believe is about three and a half feet. Mm -hmm. by the width of the shipping container, which I believe is a, that, that one is about 12. So I think it's yeah. roughly four by 12 feet. And before we go to the next project, um, which is a very monumental one, I just remember that in addition to this toxic waste as a body, but there's also, uh, you know, not, um, carcinogenic dust from the lake. Am I yes. right? Yes. So, okay, you have to, uh, to go back to this mid-century modern exploited Great Basin. Uh, the Owens Lake is one of hundreds of basins that stretch between the Rockies and the Sierra. Uh, once upon a time, there were glacial lakes that flowed one into another through the massive uh, basin and a giant earthquake created a rift which yeah. ultimately created the Colorado River, which allowed that water to flow out to sea. And these basins became desiccated, but had um, seasonal floods and many of them remained full of water. Yeah. Um, when this one in particular dried out, it created um, dust storms that carry uh, the world's largest uh, propagator of carcinogenic dust. Mm -hmm. um, over not only the continent, but the Pacific Ocean into China. Yeah. So again, to come back to this mandate that somehow artists need to create on the same scale that society has the capacity to destroy. Yeah. You have this hundred mile lake that has to be networked into our regenerative conception. Yeah. Because even though we didn't do it, we're the inheritors of it. Yeah. And it's uh, affecting the biome of the ocean, the disappearance of the coral reefs. Um, there's no place for proto-pollinators like birds to land anymore. Mm -hmm. The follow-on effect of, of that move is profound, but yeah. it also was the critical thing which the, the carcinogenic dust, like this virus, mm -hmm. created a consciousness around a place which was already in trouble. And the US government, through the Environmental Protection Agency mandated that yeah. the state of California get that dust under control. Yeah. And yeah. so the state of California defaulted to the city of Los Angeles, yeah. which was until uh, Metabolic Studio got a private water right, the mm -hmm. only holder of a water right in the city of Los Angeles. So they were ultimately responsible to fix the problem. Yeah. And we've spent billions of dollars trying to fix the problem and it's still nowhere near resolved. So the question is how can we artists mm -hmm. posit concepts mm -hmm. that will bring consciousness to something that affects us all? Yeah, couldn't agree more. I mean, that's exactly was Boyd's aspiration too. You know, we, if we believe in a certain practice of shamanism, uh, we believe in the wisdom of the old, the ancient. As right now, the way I feel about COVID-19 pandemic is really nature saying to herself, I can no longer take your aggressive abuse. So I'm gonna allow my body to heal. And I think that's what we are trying to do. We're trying to heal things, Lauren. So this is a good example. This is the the inverted pine that, that you made specifically for this church, the site of our collaboration in the last collateral project, the Venice Biennale, the last one. So share with us a little bit of how yes. you discovered that hole and made the work accordingly. 
Okay. Well, th let, first, there's two things that uh, that need to come together as context. Yeah. Uh, one is that um, we in the West are experiencing every November these major mega fires that are defining the imprint of the West in relationship to global warming. Mm -hmm. uh, Venice is experiencing an unusual frequency of aqua alta, yep. which is the opposite context with equal treachery. So Venice is, in a par is teetering on a perilous edge, as is the West, but for opposite reasons. So this is a piece which attempts to, like the two-chambered lung <laughs> of the <laughs> yeah. um, beehive, attempts to bring into focus in one perceptual space these two contexts yeah. of global warming's uh, manifestation, rising tides and the, um, and the burning forests. Mm -hmm. And in that, what came to my mind is that between the West and Venice, there's the pine tree, which is the connecting theme. The pine tree is pine tree is ubiquitous to all Mediterranean climates, yeah. and Southern California is one of the few places on Earth which enjoys a Mediterranean climate. So yeah. to manifest a burnt pine uh, mm. as a sculptural artifact in a church that had a pre-existing hole in the floor. Yeah. that was caused by um, the rising tides slowly eroding the yeah. um, structure that holds the floor up, to pose them one on top of the other was a way to build a perceptual frame yeah. um, that's relate relating these two as one experience that's happening everywhere all the time right now, yeah. which is that we are climate I, crisis, climate yeah. crisis, is um, like the virus yeah. threatening um, human uh, beings with extinction. And it was an attempt to use the frame of yeah. uh, the Mediterranean and the cultural tourism of the Venice Biennale yeah. to communicate uh, what art needs to do moving forward. Well, we did it well. Can I, can, can, can I ask JC to go back so we can see the burn part right here? On the right, far right, is the remnant, very distinct, direct evidence of what so that that is actually a, um, an, a death mask, as it were, that was made around a tree of my friend, an amazing um, artist, Lita Albuquerque, who lost uh, her family home and her work in the Wolseley Malibu fire uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, November and uh, she and I have been uh, communicating um, in deep ways about loss and what loss and surrender means for artists. Um, so she allowed me to um, remove this desiccated pine tree to my studio where my um, amazing assistant Rachel and the optics division ground the carbon from uh, the tree, uh, made a wire mesh, mesh death, death mask and uh, took rice paper and dipped it into mm. the carbon from Lita's ground up tree to form that amazing black feather-like husk yeah. uh, of the tree uh, for the church. And, and there's a way that it's lying in space that to come back to my dance background feels balletic it yeah. feels pauvering, and it also has a striking allusion to the Pieta. Yes. So it was a, a way of uh, offering surrender and also creating the idea of, um, you know, fragility. Uh, yes. This piece was actually in, uh, in, it stayed installed during the November Aqua Alta when we were all there to close the show. And my other colleague, uh, Roxanne Steinberg, actually performed in the Aqua Alta in four feet of water above that hole, um, a, a dance um, to the moon and the tides 
uh, and we didn't remove that piece. So again, the whole idea of the fetishized art object, which needs to be temperature controlled and yeah. you know, in its own building, was in our case, in this collateral biennale, literally just an offering, like, a, like throwing a flower into water and recalling Lucio Fontana's brilliant statement that in the eyes of eternity, art that lasts a second is the same as art that lasts a millennium. Yeah, we have experienced that. Which bring to mind this piece too, Lauren. This is the, the piece that you made, um, inspired by Shan Jerome. Yeah. And so this is also very, I find it incredibly frightening. It was yeah. in that dark room and it's painted with tar and all kind of toxic substances. So can you yeah. share with us this piece before we... Yeah, this, this is an homage to uh, an Antonella de Messina's uh, painting. It's considered the first oil painting in cultural history of Saint Jerome and his study. And Saint Jerome was sainted for his translation of the Bible from Greek and Hebrew into Latin. Mm -hmm. And in uh, Antonella de Messina's uh, painting, you'll see Saint Jerome sitting at his scholarly desk. And in the windows high above his desk, you can see the fields, um, the agricultural fields that um, I believe uh, he painted in as an allusion to how scholarship needs to be supported by food in order to give the scholar time to do his or her work. So this work was a um, reinterpretation of St. Jerome's desk. It has uh, placed the artist or in, 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 a, in a sense, uh, myself or, or other artists like me as translators of living systems um, into action. Uh, the yep. top shelf has seed pods that are terracotta collected from the Hopi dry bed farmers where I got my corn seeds. There's Rudolf Steiner and Joseph Boyce books there. There's the first uh, whole earth catalog in there. There's other um, sculptures that um, have totemic meaning for me and uh, other materials that uh, draw a link between um, arte povera, uh, mm -hmm. like sheep's wool coming out of the desk like innards. And then the entire thing was uh, dipped in tar, yeah. um, which was obviously an allusion to our moment in time where, um, you know, we are, we're dipping our, everything that we're making, everything that we care about, we're immersing it mm -hmm. in uh, in the residue of the petroleum industry. So, uh, but it was also an acknowledgement of tar's stickiness. Mm -hmm. So that sculpture starts to reemerge as coated, like that whole thing about tar and feathers, like that thing is uh, impossible to clean. Yeah. Um, so um, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a built poem in a way. Well, it, it just referenced you just what you just say uh, about Lucio Fontana. Um, so it goes directly to, again, the slogan, artists need to create on the same scale, you know. So scale is a psychological space, how we mediate with the object we made, whether it's time-based or it's permanent object to keep. So. Which and also, I just wanted to mention that art is, all, uh, uh, is, a, is a function of privilege, right? So mm -hmm. all of us who have the ability to make art or write or to think about the world in a new form or to translate are being supported by people who are growing our food. Yes. Um, and especially here on Earth Day, um, this piece, if it means anything, uh, means that um, you know, let's be sure to thank consciously um, yeah. all the people out there who are right now bringing us food and medicine mm -hmm. on a daily basis so we can have this conversation and we can re-envision the way forward. Well, it could be more frightening as an omen, as JC said from the beginning, the oil spill that led to Earth Day. So this mm -hmm. is how we end it with a, a hopefully an optimistic note. Which yeah. and now can we basically lead to Lauren's last monumental piece, larger scale, uh, which is bending to the river. Can we somehow 
play a segment and then you can talk a little bit about it, Lauren, before we open up to our listener and viewers. Sure. Are you going to, uh, JC, are we going to um, play the se section or should I um, say a few things at this image and then we play the Earth Day video? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is uh, the at last moment. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, seven years and 78 permits uh, into bending the river back into the city last You're September. Torture. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and like talk about a performance that uh, you know the gleaning of all that performance is an endur uh, is, is an endur endurance performance for sure um, but again like working say, with the, uh, mule packers the opportunity to work with amazing civil engineers and construction industry to yeah. be able to make the first alteration in the LA River Federal Army Corps floodplain mitigation project, uh, which is, uh, this form was built 75 years ago, is a really amazing opportunity. So these images are, uh, are uh, pictures of us um, finally in construction. Um, should we go to the next one? Uh, what we did here was we um, laid uh, 180 feet of pipe under the jacket of the LA River. So we scored triangles into the concrete, which we then lift out. And then we um, discovered underneath the concrete mm -hmm. an incredible thing, which is the still vital and enchanted floodplain of the unbridled river, full of seeds and mycelium and all other kinds of living systems. Um, then we put uh, pipes into that 180 foot section mm -hmm. um, as a test on how the um, engineers uh, uh, envisioning of the redirection of that low flow channel of the river, which is in the middle there, yeah. that there's always that much water flowing in the LA River, even after, right? This image was taken after four months of no rain. Mm -hmm. uh, and after the summer, so that's water that's coming from, um, you know, the, the hoses and, and gutters and um, everything else that moves water uh, from our streets and, and our hills into this river. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the pipes will take a small portion of that low flow channel and redirect it under the Alameda corridor train tracks to a water wheel which will lift it into a native wetland, which will cleanse it and distribute it to a network of public parks where we're hoping to grow forageable food and medicine for people. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And other living systems. Yeah. Well, this is terrific. Do we have another little segment of video or not really? Yes, I think we, we are going to do is we're going to uh, end um, this before the question and answers with a video that we're, we've made for today, for Earth Day, right. um, which is about that floodplain and about our studio site and about to go back to the B, the idea that even in this quarantine, the joining together of human voice is an act of regeneration. So uh, the soundtrack in this short video is an original score written as an homage for the water wheel by the brilliant composer Olan Jones mm -hmm. for our interdependence choir. Um, and the video was edited yesterday um, uh, for release today and to share with you all. And, it, uh, and after that, I think we'll segue into our question and answer. Beautiful. JC, take it away.
Cool. Thank you, Lawrence. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. JC, let's uh, open up to our Yes, friend. amazing. Thank you both so much for that conversation. I, I don't know about everyone else, but I was scribbling furiously in my notebook the entire time. Um, we've got a few questions already. And if, if you come up with a question now during this back and forth, you can definitely just leave it in the chat um, for anybody there. And we'll see how many we have time to get to. Um, the first question that I wanted to start with is from Madeline. Uh, Madeline, I'm gonna unmute you if that's okay. Lauren, thank you so much, and thank you, Fong. Um, I actually have a very, very simple question to start. Um, and Lauren, we had the privilege of meeting in Venice, and I was talking to you a bit sort of about my momentary sort of unhappiness living in New York, where I am from, and my relationship with is somewhat contentious. And you asked me something that has um, stuck with me for a long time. You asked me what my ideal city looks like. Um, and it's something I've thought about a lot over the past few months, and I actually would love to turn it back to you and ask you what your ideal city looks like. Mm, that's a very good question. Um, my ideal uh, city or the city that uh, wants to emerge um, is, a, is a regenerative, sustainable city which considers all of its means product of production as having a feedback loop to the life web from which everything can be extracted. So I think that an ideal city is going to uh, require us to think that wherever we are can be an ideal city. And um, in my particular case, I think that my ideal city of Los Angeles is one in which the adaptive reuse of our infrastructure um, is well underway so that um, we can again make this Mediterranean climate um, bear fruit um, and be um, a breadbasket for um, all kinds of living systems. Um, my other form of ideal city would be one in, in which um, we redefine our borders from outmoded um, ideas of municipality into thinking about uh, our borders as being our watershed um, so that the underpinning of place is actually thought through by the acknowledgement that water is life and that um, our lifestyle is supported by a watershed that we in turn need to support. Thank you so much. Thank you. You are definitely well on your way to making that city a reality. Um, our next question, I really, that project's so cool. I, I, I like put this in the chat dramatically, but I used to get so mad driving over the LA River, like all that water just, and I'm so glad you're doing that. It's important work. Um, our next question is from Terry Myers. Um, Terry, I'm gonna unmute you now. Thanks, John. Lauren, thank you so much. Um, greetings from Los Feliz. That's, that's my view, but it's virtual out on the street, you know, with all those palms that aren't supposed to be here on Finley Avenue. But um, I guess it's a good segue from the first question. I've been sitting here the whole time thinking about maybe more the art side of it related to LA and that how much you are to me such a, this is maybe more of a comment that may, hopefully you can respond to sort of a quintessential Los Angeles artist. When I moved here in the early 90s from New York, I'd been coming here for a while, you know, Mike Kelly was the LA artist, every European curator, you know, that was just like, I'm like, well, there's a lot going on out there. And they're like, yeah, but what is going on out there? But mainly because uh, you can go back to the late 19th century with artists here. Um, many people don't know these people, a guy named Ben Berlin, who was working in the 19 teens, who sort of figured out cubism, but then sort of disrespected it. You know, you think about Lorzer Feidelson and Helen Lundberg, you know, like uh, you think about Keenholz, you think about someone like Lita, who is here with us today, I saw her. You know, LA artists have a different relationship, and not just artists, I would say cultural producers, to the notion of what a boundary is in the first place. Yeah. And I see your work sort of fitting that and just taking us through the, the history of a lot of people working with the environment 
and the planet in their work in a particular LA way that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that LA artist name sort of got dissipated in the 2000s and that it became less of a thing. But, you know, people outside of LA still think about it. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are about LA's relationship to maybe, you know, boundaries other than the, the, the borders and the things you've been talking about, aesthetic boundaries, yeah. boundaries of type, so on and so forth. Thank you so much for your question, Terry. And I wrote down some of those uh, names to look up. Um, well, for me, um, the, the unique uh, trajectory that LA um, offered uh, was the feminist art movement and um, the historic women's building, which is right next door to Metabolic Studio, was critical. I mean, it's, it's uh, the artists that put that together um, in the 90s were truly embarking on a completely revisionist view of the art world and what it meant to have artistic agency. So, you know, I would say that the trajectory that I feel most keenly uh, that I try to adhere to and uphold is what the women's building artists and the, fe and the feminists put into play in Los Angeles, which uh, really transformed the art field internationally. Um, and, you know, we're still at work <laughs> um, yeah. doing it, but the whole idea of how equal access to platforms of communication from uh, museums, curators, shows, collectors um, was uniquely and still remains pretty much uh, way disproportionately um, uh, male and often white male. The women's building set out to rehistoricize art history um, through Judy Chicago's uh, challenge to um, bring courses together to think through that. Um, her student, uh, Suzanne Lacey, um, completely revolutionized uh, the world in uh, bringing the term social practice to an international mm -hmm. art audience and uh, uh, became um, a teacher, a profound teacher, still teaching and training generations of, um, of people to think not just about gender, but race. Um, and uh, what, um, what needs to happen is that the way forward remains uh, a collective manifestation. And I think LA being, um, has been ahead of the curve in setting the agenda for social practice, uh, gender conscious, uh, uh, thinking about access to museums. Um, and also um, I would say the whole idea of maintenance art, which, um, which is part of social practice, which great artists from the East Coast, like uh, Ukelis Letterman um, with the New York uh, City Sanitation Department um, projects uh, brought to Los Angeles through her colleagues at the Women's Building and then threw them into my mind, the idea that um, Sometimes the best thing we can do as an art practice is to clean things up. Yes. And that's usually been uh, at, at, the, at the gender divide. <laughs> you know, the great genius makes the work and then the women make lunch and clean up. So, you know, I think that, that's, that those are kind of unique Los Angeles attributes that Metabolic Studio kind of tries to carry on. Right. That, that's fantastic, Lauren. I'll just say quickly that when I moved here in 94 from New York, it was to become the first critic in residence at Otis. And, you know, Sue Mayberry, who was the director of the library at that point, was instrumental in the Women's Building slide archive being brought to Otis. That's now all available, scanned through the Getty. And I invited my great friend and colleague, Laura Cottingham from New York, to come out and be in residence for a week. And she did this amazing slide talk from the slides, discovering the lesbian fashion show that happened at the women's building, like all these things beyond the sort of narrow notion of art in these slides. Um, so I'll just put that out. If anyone's interested, the, I think the, everything's available on the Getty's website. They scanned that entire slide archive. The women's building was so, so crucial. And of course, the feminist art program and all of that. Yeah, and just thank you. thank you for that, Terry. And just a quick shout out to, uh, 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 we, just, we just lost, um, uh, oh my God, what's her name? 
We, uh, we just lost the great artist, um, I'm blanking because we're naming so many people, uh, who is um, um, Cheryl Swanick, thank you. Um, Cheryl Swanick was um, also the person who physically built the women's uh, building and saw construction as one of the last frontiers of gender separation. And so with Bending the River for uh, me to be out there uh, working with, um, you know, federal engineers is also an homage right. to There Cheryl. are so many slides of the women building the women's building in that archive too. Some, they had the fourth site to have a photographer photograph because they were, there are these great stories about them going to the hardware store and they're like, honey, do you know how to use this hammer? You know, that kind of attitude. So there are all these photographs in, in that archive of the yeah. building actually being built. Um, Gary, um, Lauren, I'd like to add one thing that what you just spoke already about LA and also that go for um, also San Francisco, or, or the, the whole idea of, of you know, West Coast. West Coast never really looked at New York City, really. It, it really inspired to look towards Europe. And I think that association of Lauren, you know, commitment or fascination with boy, it's to me seemed very natural, more than look for New York. I don't yeah. think LA and San Francisco people ever did that, artists ever did that really. Um, well, just to throw in that the great curator Walter Hopps did the first okay. ever retrospective of Marcel Duchamp at the Pasadena Museum of Modern Art. So Marcel Duchamp was never able to get a retrospective until, uh, Walter Hopps uh, canonized his work and it was the last show of his lifetime. So I do think that curators were looking towards New York, but they were looking to put together shows that perhaps couldn't happen in New York. Yeah, and I, I wanted to also just um, follow up a little bit to Madeline's question, because I remember when I started working on the rail, I memorized Ernst Cassirade a statement about utopia. He say, um, "In utop a utopia is not a portrait of a real world, of the actual political or social order. It exists at no moment of time, and at no point in space. It is nowhere. But just such a conception of a uh, nowhere has stood for the test and proved its strength in the development of the modern world." follows from the nature and the character of the ethical thought that it can never condense, condescend to accept the given. The ethical world is never given. It is forever in the making. Mm -hmm. I hope I remember that right, <laughs> but just want to make sure you heard that, <laughs> um, Madeline. Thank you, Fang. Um... And Terry, and thank you for your question also. Lauren was a great answer. We're gonna go, I think we have time for probably one or one or two more questions if everyone's good with that. We had um, a great question from Beatrice. I'm going to unmute you now, Beatrice, if that's if that's okay with you. Um, let's see. Beatrice, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, I have a question about uh, the participation of communities of colors and underrepresented people. First, I want to say thank you, Lauren, for your great work and this opportunity. Um, I know you have experience, but, and I would like to understand better how to uh, make this participation a little bit larger. Um, so yes. that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. I think the third and most challenging uh, part of bending the river back into the city will be forming a citizen's utility. So the idea of having a private water right to 106 acre feet of water, cleansing it in a regenerative uh, 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 wetland and distributing it to the network of parks creates a challenge to the community about who is this for? Mm -hmm. How does it benefit? And who are the activators of that potentiality? Because as an infrastructure monument, this will go on after I'm not alive, after the studio no longer exists. So the idea of forming a citizen's utility is the next frontier for participation. Um, and we're starting at the studio to look at that 
as a network of people in our neighborhood who are co-creating our medicine and food shed. Um, so we are forming a network of people that you can participate in joining tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time is our first virtual Zoom meeting. It's called the Interdependence Salon. But the idea of that is to account for um, what we have currently in our, in our store room, what work needs to be done and how people can contribute to participate uh, so that uh, as many people as possible have access, especially during this challenging time, to medicine, seeds, uh, and uh, a process of making them and storing them that is collective. Cool. Nice. Thank you, Laurie. Um, and for our last question, we're going to go to our very own Nick Bennett. Um, Nick, do you want to unmute yourself? Or I can unmute you. Oh, there you are. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Lauren. Um, it's such a pleasure to see you. And you thank too. You for joining us today. Um, my question is: My mindset's lately been in artistic lineage, and <clears throat> I thought of the video that Newton Harrison made for the collateral event that we did in Venice. And in it, there is a portion where he's talking about. Um, how the Mediterranean is being affected by cruise ships and the tour tourism industry. And you kind of mentioned this earlier too. Um, I'm curious, and I know this is a broad question, but I'm curious how we can sort of dynamically reassess and rethink our, our, our actions and our thought behavior processes in the quote unquote art world. Um, because, you know, Venice as this wonderful, the Biennale, you know, it generates so much waste and there much activism I noticed there of local citizens and I'm curious how you think about that um, and in a way I'm thinking of that kind of global initiative that you have with with Newton and um, yeah I'm just curious about that. Thank you well you brought up a, a lot of things first of all wonderful to see you Nick. Um, the Mediterranean Sea is the smallest sea with the biggest story so when we, when we embarked collectively to do the Venice Biennale, what really um, was, was at heart for Newton and for me as well, was whether we could bring a larger vision or context to how cultural tourism negatively impacts the Mediterranean and to get ourselves to question um, the overall imprint of uh, soft diplomacy like biennales and whatnot and their impact on the life web. So in Newton's piece for the Venice Biennale, he specifically writes, uh, basically eulogizes the Mediterranean because he doesn't see any way that the exploitation of all of the rivers that flow from all of the countries that border the Mediterranean Sea the exploitation is that where those rivers empty into the Mediterranean, they're almost entirely colonized by tourism. They're the nicest places, um, and so they're almost all for international tourism. And how overfishing of the Mediterranean has uh, depleted the food res re uh, reserve to such an extent that restaurants were serving fish um, that are supposed to be Mediterranean fish that are actually shipped in from other places on airplanes. Um, and when the military industrial complex uh, has its base in Naples um, and the international fleets are docked there, what the imprint of the very cheap fossil fuel that's um, spent in those military uh, industrial complexes have, and that's before you get to the mining of oil in the Mediterranean Sea. So what Newton basically did was uh, eulogize the Mediterranean. And I would suggest that it's in this moment of uh, collective pause that we reconsider our um, power as consumers. Uh, how consumption of everything you personally have the power to consume 
can be righted by the thinking about walking yourself through the imprint that that has on the life web and asking yourself, is it worth it? Is there other ways to participate that are less damaging? And also to evoke um, the seven generation mentality, you know, which is again, some of my colleagues who are, uh, and friends who have been guides and teachers who are Native American have said that no decision for them tribally is made without thinking about the seven generations of ancestry that got them to this point and the seven generations that will precede them. So I would say it would be very wise for us when thinking about moving forward to think about the power you have as a consumer and think about whether it's impacting the life web properly. And if so, can that be true for seven generations? Thank you. Lovely, thank you, Lauren. Thanks, Nick, for that question. Um, I wanna take this, this moment just to shout out the, uh, the whole Metabolic Studio team. Um, they're collaborators with us in Venice last year, and it was a pleasure and a privilege to, to get to work with them. And this is kind of a nice little reunion. It's good to see all your names in the chat bar. And, uh, I, I, I have to, but, and I'm sorry, JC, but I just want to kind of commemorate too. It's it's almost exactly a year ago today. So just yeah. give it a day, so. Wow, what a difference a year makes. And also just to say that the studio gathered every night uh, during the um, beginning of the Venice Biennale for, for a meal and a uh, social environment. Um, so our virtual presence today is really anchored in uh, a very wonderful network of evenings around the ritual of dining and sharing time and space. And I also would say on, you know, Earth Day to also say how profoundly affected and arrested we were by the magnificence of Venice and of the stones that had been wrought from both Venice and Istria to build that city um, and the engineering to underpin it and the magnificent dance of light on water as being the, um, the, the mycelium strands that connects us now in this virtual world. So um, I think that, that, that that's also really important and it's why we come together around soft diplomacy is so that when we can't be together, it's based in something tangible and real and magical. Definitely. And that the, the meal as the original social environment and it, it spun off some today's conversation, but also like the music and the dance and the poetry that happened in Venice. And I saw a few of the production assistants here today that were, it was, you know, the village, it's a village and villages are connected with mycelium, both literal and emotional. Um, it was really, um, we're going to move to our traditional, uh, is it traditional now? I suppose it is, our traditional reading of a poem, um, which we use to close every lunch conversation, both in the office and um, online. Um, our production assistant, Georgia, is going to read for us today. Georgia, I'm going to unmute you now. Or are we unmuting you at the same time? Are you there? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Great. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, happy Earth Day, everyone. Thank you so much, Lauren, for uh, talking to us today. Everything you do is absolutely incredible. And uh, thank you, Fong and JC. Today, I will be reading Water Devil by Jamal May, and it goes like this. Spout of a leaf, listen out for the screams of your relentless audience. The applause of a waterfall in the distance. A hurricane looting a Miami shopping mall. How careful you are with the rain cradling curve of your back. Near your forest, are you ready to swim and happy to drown in me, this lake of fire that moats the edges? From my mouth, they come to peel the flames and drink their slick throats into the most silent of ashes. Thank you. Lovely, thank you, Georgia. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Fong. Thank you to the Metabolic team and the Rail team. Um, we had Tyler and Malvika on closed captions today. Thank you for that. Um, support with accessibility. Um, you can join us every day here. Tomorrow we've got uh, the South Korean artist Min Jun Kim 
and uh, being interviewed by Helen Lee, which would be a great conversation. Um, and if you missed part of the conversation or someone you know missed it, you can find all of these on our YouTube um, posted about 5 p.m. the day of. Um, great. Thank you all. Thank you. And uh, go forth and prosper. Thank you, Lauren. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for this Thank opportunity. You guys. I see some faces from LA. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Tristan. <laughs> Good to see you. I have Bye. to have one more thing. What's really yeah. amazing is that. Hi, Lena. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> it was amazing, Lauren. Thank you so much. It was just beautiful. And then the, all the voices at the end and all the voices in the, in the singing. Uh, but I have to uh, put together the two, two things. The, the fact that it's the 50 year anniversary uh, of, of, um, of Earth Day. And just last year was the 50th anniversary of landing on the moon. And we're oh. connected. It's that connection. Oh, you know, my God. Our consciousness finally <laughs> is getting the relationship between the Earth and the cosmos together. Oh, my and God. I that's, that was, wow. Yeah. I just, and, uh, but legal, that, that's a great. <laughs> Because it's a because it's like an auspicious Earth Day because it's a new moon tonight. Oh wow! Yeah, amazing. So yeah, I mean our consciousness is getting you know we're we're inching. Well, we're, I think we're more than inching along. I think we're we're flying, and I think it's it, these kinds of uh, meetings just shows it and the beauty of it and how wonderful it is for all of us to connect and be together in this extraordinary consciousness and lauren thank you really thank you it's so lovely to see your beautiful face and your <laughs> blue shirt leave a blue <laughs>